Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's Ash here. I hope you're doing well. Today I have a very special video for you. This discussion was actually inspired by a comment that was left on one of my videos a few months ago now. A friend of mine asked what advice I had for people who were neurodivergent trying to get into the workplace. Now, Admittedly, this question left me a little embarrassed because I didn't have any advice to go back to him with. So I said I'd go away, do some research into the topic and get back to him. Now, very fortuitously, the business I work for actually booked a session to discuss this exact same thing with today's guest. And during the session, I asked the exact question to him. I asked him, what advice do you have for people who are neurodivergent trying to get into the workplace? And he said this was quite a big question to answer in a couple of minutes, so he'd be happy to take it offline so I thought great and instead of having that conversation curating his ideas making a video and pretending I'm some kind of expert on the subject I thought let's record the conversation let's put it out there for people to see in a kind of podcast format and we can all learn together so today's guest is Daniel he is the founder of adjust he established adjust in 2016 to help organizations start their neurodiversity conversation he provides workshops and training for businesses to help them be more inclusive to those who are neurodivergent. I've left links in the description below for Daniel so you can get in contact with him directly to find out more and for organizations that were referenced in the conversation as well. This is the first type of conversation I'm doing or podcast I'm doing so please let me know what your thoughts are and if you'd like to see more of it with different guests. So without any further ado here is my conversation with Daniel. I was just telling someone the other day about the training you did for us and um, how eye-opening it was. It was so interesting just to like, just just to hear about the the different kind of neurodiverse people that that you may come across in in the workplace and interview. And there was just so many different topics we covered, um, and not one person I spoke to didn't take something away yeah. from the sessions. So really appreciate you taking the time to come down, spend some time with us over at MVF, and we've actually began spoiler alert we've actually began the process of setting up a neurodiverse network excellent at, at mvf so that's super exciting and that's literally off the back of what you did with us Brilliant. So thank you so much for, for spending the time could you tell tell us a little bit about what you cover in sessions yes yeah, so yes yeah, so my name is daniel founded an organization called adjust to provide clear and practical understanding of neurodiversity in the workplace um and what what i talk about when it's about neurodiversity is like I always reference the person who came up with the phrase Judy Singer back in 98, and she compared neurodiversity to like biodiversity and that actually within the human species, we've got people that think differently for a reason. And you might remember in my training, I talked about how like you think about like a cactus, a cactus like really does well in the desert, but then you move that cactus to back garden or back gardens in London, it's not going to do very well. But we wouldn't say there's something broken or wrong with that cactus. So it's really trying to change people's perceptions around things like that adjust we focus on autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia and ADHD um, to, to help people understand that concept. Uh, neurodiversity could be considered even wider than that, like with things like Tourette's and epilepsy. Um, and what I really like about neurodiversity, I think finally, is like a positive word for those groups people with autis autistic people or dyslexic people etc because for a long time I think that was only referred to quite negatively um, and it's not just about I don't know some people will talk about it in terms of superpower I don't really talk about it in terms of superpower I talk about it in terms of getting the balance right and understanding in some situations some people need certain adaptions like that cactus might need to go in a greenhouse in my back garden in London um, to thrive um, yeah, and other people talk about it in terms of superpower. I just think, like, for some people, you still got to acknowledge there's things they find difficult as well. But we just focused on that for, for like the last 30, 50 years. We only focused on what people couldn't do. And I think it's a really hard way to live your life, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's great that people like yourself are, are doing work because I've spoken to so many people just haphazardly and they found out they had dyslexia or they found out they had ADHD at the age of like 30 or something yeah. like that and they went through their whole educational life they went through a large portion of their working life up until that point not knowing mm. why they were feeling these things or why they couldn't do certain things and and just holding them back so I think the work you're doing is is really really important 
Would would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got to where you are today with Adust? <clears throat> well, yeah, so originally I wanted to be a social worker when I was younger. Um, so I spoke to a social worker and she said, do some volunteering. And I was 16 at the time and I said, no, no, thanks. Um, that sounds like working for free. <laughs> but you know what it's like when you're that age? I went into college a couple of weeks later and there was a notice board at college that said, come and volunteer with our autistic son on a play scheme. And I don't think I always mention this on training, but um, actually that play scheme at the time, this was the year 2000, and um, the idea of the play scheme, it was so wrong. The idea of it was to cure him of his autism. I didn't know at the time, you know, I was 16. I just said, yeah, I'll do some volunteering. Um, I didn't know how fundamentally wrong that was in terms of how autistic people, you know, if we're talking about neurodiversity, autism is just a variation on, on the human species and the way people think. Like, we can't cure it. And um, it was terrible, really, because we had to do things like make him step the little boy stare us in the face, which he found really hard, do sort of certain types of play that he found hard. Basically, anything he found hard, the play scheme thing was supposed to make him overcome that. Um, oh. And he's, he was four then, and I hope now, you know, he'd be 24. I hope actually as life went on, there was a lot more acceptance for, for, for him from his family and stuff. But um, I think we've actually all, you know, all been on this journey together in life. Like 20 years ago, we were talking about that, curing. Nowadays, my college wouldn't, you know, college wouldn't get away with advertising opportunities mm-hmm. like that. Um, so that's how I got into it. I just got fascinated by people that thought differently really and went to university did my dissertation around autism went to work at the national autistic society where i helped autistic people into jobs Um, and a big part of that actually i started to see was changing not the autistic person but changing you the employer and getting you to change some of the ways you do things so you know like autistic people would say to me um you know, like they'd go to an interview and they'd say, oh, I got asked this question, like, tell me about yourself. And they'd say like, oh, I told them all about myself. And I'd be like, well, no, that question's really meant to draw out some ski, key skills and experiences. And then, and then one day an autistic person said to me, well, why don't everybody just ask the question how you just told me, you know, why don't you yeah. say it like that to them? And then I started working with employers and getting them to change their interview questions to tell me three key skills and experiences you have in life that relate to, the work you want to do with us and actually that's better question sometimes especially when you're younger and you first go into the job market and an employer says you know tell me about yourself whether you're autistic or not you're like well what do they want to know like <laughs> it, it is a tricky question so I'm just trying to get employees to become more inclusive and spent a couple of years working at a university helping students get diagnosed with things like dyslexia and ADHD um some neurodiverse profiles and set up just five years ago because I thought there was sort of there wasn't enough organisations out there really supporting you, the employer. So I want to give the employers like the the ability and the tools to become sort of neurodiverse friendly. And, and like it's fantastic for me to hear you say that um, you're setting up a neurodiversity staff network because that's what I want to happen. I, I don't want you to continuously have to come back to me. You know, I want to give you the tools and, and you go away and do it. And actually, as I've continued on my journey around this, I relate a lot more to ADHD than I ever thought I did when I was younger. And I think that's that's the way I am as well. Like I want to come in, work with you, get you guys all set up, and then I want to work with someone else. That's, that's mm. I don't want to just work with one client yeah. forever. <laughs> Otherwise I'd just have a have a job like that. So I think that that really that really suits me as well. But yeah, it's fun, so good for me to hear that you're setting up a neurodiversity staff network. Yeah. So how in depth do you get with businesses then? Is it just kind of that initial training or is there more? more So I sort of focus on three areas, the initial awareness. And at the end of the awareness, there's sort of like um, seven steps that I say that you need for stuff to go on next. And one of them is policies and procedures. So we can help with that. One is training up managers. We help with that. One is training up recruitment teams. We help with that. One is employee support, which could be setting up networks like you've done or it's things like coaching and assessments for people. Um, uh, uh, and we like work with partnership organizations to help you provide that. And the colleague awareness and allyship is like what you, what you did with me really. So I think that's the seven areas, but yeah. So mainly it's like the recruitment and the managers and the, and the basic awareness. And then I want you guys to sort of put that into what you do and, and take it from there. Perfect. I want to touch on that a little bit more, um, a little bit later on. But when we, because I mean, before you came along, the term neurodiversity was actually quite a new term to me. Mm. So would you mind kind of giving us a, maybe an explanation of what they covered under that term? 
Yeah, so I think neurodiversity is, you know, like I said, it was first coined in 1998 by someone called Judy Singer, and, and she compared neurodiversity. She says we're all neurodiverse. And then I think there's a key, because she's saying that's the human species, but I think there's a key, and it's sometimes controversial maybe, differentiator there, that actually in the workplace, I think it's become a celebratory term and banner for groups um, that are that do think differently. Uh, and then under that, you know, I get asked it a lot, but I would never want to say something isn't under it. Does that make sense? But I think yeah. anything where someone f- thinks differently, learns differently um, um, from the majority, because I think when I when I came in, there's a stat which says 15% of your workforce could be neurodiverse or neurodivergent in some way. Um, so it's anybody that sort of, I think, thinks differently or relates to it. I'm a big believer in self-identification as well. Um, and the more I think about the term, I really like the term neurodiverse just to sometimes we don't even know what the label is, but you just might know you, you think quite differently from others. So I, I really celebrate the term. Um, I'd never say something isn't under it, but things like autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, commonly talked about, things like Tourette's, epilepsy, things like dysgraphia and dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is maybe the difficulty with numbers. So, yeah, any of these terms where some, something sort of, someone thinks in a different way. Okay. And do you specialise in, in specific areas or, of these or is it across the board? Yeah, at Adjust, we specialise in autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia and ADHD. And I really believe if you can become inclusive for those four, you're going to be very inclusive employer because then your mind's going to be open. You're going to be like, oh, I understand some people process in a different way. Some people prefer visual information. Um, some people prefer like not to have phone calls, etc. So I think if you, what I've tried to get employers to do is not to become too fixed on those labels, but sort yeah. of see some of the characteristics I talk about, like processing, working memory, communication, and the impact of the sensory environment. And I think I use those four to help employers understand that some people think more differently than others. But yeah, they're the four we focus on. Um, okay. And when, when we're talking about these four, like what kind of struggles, but also what kind of advantages do people with these um uh with, with these characteristics have I, from, from what i've seen throughout my career um creativity i think if you think differently from the majority you're going to be creative and i often think anybody that's done anything astonishing throughout history is probably neurodiverse in some way um so creativity problem solving a lot of autistic people dyslexic people have um what's sort of more commonly known around the pattern recognition ability obviously everybody's different um, but then I've seen for some people with ADHD and dyspraxia, <clears throat> they have, to use a phrase, more thinking on your feet type of problem solving. So by thinking on your feet, I mean, you know, like something comes in right now, we just find a way around it. So, you know, for instance, I said I relate to ADHD, I really struggle to like write neatly on a board and that, that could be connected to dyspraxia. This is why I like neurodiversity, but I was doing a session once in my job and we, we ran contracts for the job centre through the National Autistic Society to get autistic people jobs. So they'd come in and um, assess us and how we were doing. And one day I was doing a workshop and I was like, oh God, I'm being assessed. I'm gonna have to write on the board and stuff like that. So what I did was I said to the participants, we did how many types of communication are there? That was the session. You'd be surprised. There's like probably more than 50. And you'd come up with one and I'd say, all right, you've, you've said communication is talking. You come and write that on the board. And then they said to me, when I got assessed, the job centre person was like, that was so inclusive, how you got everyone involved and up and about. And for me, that was that's what I mean by thinking on your feet type problem solving. Yeah, I'd be awful at that pattern recognition. I don't know if you remember it at school and stuff, sometimes boxes coloured in and then the next box coloured in. And it'd be like, what's the next box? I, was, I can't do yeah. that. But that sort of yeah. thinking, you know, on your feet, like when something happens. Um, and I think we need people like that in the workplace, don't we? So mm. that's why we celebrate it. So is that so? Was that example about ADHD specifically? Well, this is what I don't know because I don't know. I've always I don't have a diagnosis for anything. But like saying year nine at school, I got sent for the sex assessment again in sixth form, again in the workplace. I've been through one. It's like I think it's ADHD, and I think it's just the struggle to write neatly. Can also cross over of dyspraxia. Um, the spelling difficulty for me, it's just around that maybe working memory and sequencing, putting words there and having people in front and doing more than one thing at once, you know, listening to people shout out different types of communication and writing them down. Um, 
Yeah, so it's just, I suppose a lot of people that are neurodiverse in some way probably feel under pressure at times in the workplace or in education, you know, maybe maybe panicked or maybe maybe a bit different. Overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, that's a good word, yeah. Yeah. And then under the terms kind of like dyslexia, dyspraxia, how, how do we define those? And what, what are those like struggles and advantages of those those different characteristics? Yeah, like, so we've just, what I always like to think about is like the characteristics and there is the diagnosis, like for dyslexia, I suppose what people commonly expect is the difficulty of reading and writing. But I talk about that with dyslexia as just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so like, that's what identifies it. But actually there's more to it behind it. And the other characteristics can be problem solving, um, good with people, quite creative, stuff like that. A lot of dyslexic people, quite visual. I used to work with a lot of um, physiotherapists who had dyslexia. And actually it really suited them because when you're working with the human body, you know, you've got to think in that sort of 3D way and stuff. Amazing. So, yeah, it's quite fascinating to think about it from that positive point of view, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And not, not to take the conversation on, on a negative turn, but one thing I've noticed, because this is probably maybe like the third or fourth interaction I've had with you personally, whether that's the general workshop you did for the whole business at MVF, then you did the more specific training, and we've had a couple of conversations. One term I've always heard growing up, but I've never heard you use it, is the term learning difficulty. Yes. So I wanted to find out from you, is that an intentional thing or what, what's your opinion on that term? So it's a definite intentional thing from me. There's lots of reasons. One, I think when we talk about something like dyslexia as a learning difficulty, I think it gives it the um, the context that it just exists in education. But you know how I've talked about dyslexia? It's like I bet loads of physiotherapists who are dyslexic. Like I don't like to think about it as a learning difficulty. I talk about it as a skills profile. I think you heard me talk about that on the training in terms of it's yeah. a skills profile. So there's some things that you might be better at if you're dyslexic and some things you might find harder. In education, it's referred to, especially in higher education, as a specific learning difficulty. I don't like that term just because it really doesn't acknowledge the things that people are good at. You know, we've got we've got the, the strengths I've already talked about. So I think I, I deliberately avoid using learning difficulty. Maybe I should bring it up and explain it sometimes, um, but I deliberately avoid it just because I, I think it doesn't, it doesn't sum people up. Like, if you think I've... You might say, oh, we've got, if someone says, oh, they've got dyslexia, it's just a learning difficulty. And it's really interesting because a lot of people say to me, oh, I've got dyslexia, it's just mild. And I always want to say, but, you know, I think about dyslexia as a strength. So if I meet someone these days who's got amazing verbal ability or I meet someone or I see someone on, on like socials or on, on the telly or something, they've got amazing verbal ability, I diagnose them with dyslexia. No so it's not, that's not from a learning difficulty, that's from... Yeah that strength and I think it's funny when people say they've got mild dyslexia because I think are they saying they've only got mild verbal ability do you know what I mean I, I just like to challenge people on that sometimes if I know them well enough yeah <laughs> but um I think it's because the stigma people are like oh I'm just just a bit mild it's, it's interesting mm. I'm really I'm really glad I asked that question now because it was kind of it was one of those questions where I was like am I allowed to ask this question yeah, yeah. I say it but yeah no thank you for that and like when when so the the channel I do I help people with kind of like interview advice career advice yeah. and the job search and stuff like that kind of giving interview tips um and I'll be honest my, my interest in neurodiversity kind of stemmed when a friend of mine left a comment on one of my videos to say how would you uh, what advice would you give people who are neurodiverse um in their job search and it was a bit embarrassing for me because I had never, I, I didn't know. I hadn't given yeah. it too much thought. I wasn't w versed on the subject by any stretch of the imagination. And lo and behold, coincidentally, that's when, like a, a couple of weeks later is when you came into MBF yeah. to do the talk with us. So to that question, um, what advice would you give to those who are neurodivergent when they're on the job search? Got that is, gosh, it's such a wide, it's a wide question. So I suppose yeah. there's different ways of approaching. So, so, so for an autistic person, um, and I used to help autistic people specifically get jobs, so I can really help with that one. One thing I'd, I'd say is get as much voluntary experience as they can. Um, a lot of autistic people I'd work with at 24, 25, for instance, they had no experience on their CV. Um, and volunteering can absolutely change that. There's, there's organisations that especially help people get into volunteering, 
you know, so it's all it's all like properly set up projects and stuff like that because there's a fine line. Like, you know, I didn't want to work in volunteering when I was younger because I was like, sounds like working for free. But I absolutely can't um, emphasise enough how much I saw it as a stepping stone for someone if they want to go on to employment. So yeah. volunteering, um, especially for a lot of autistic people I've supported, as much as I could help them get a job in the area of their interest. It's not always possible, but, you know, like Chris Packham, the nature and wildlife presenter on, on the BBC, he's autistic. And if someone had said to him when he was younger, like, you've got to stop following your passion, yeah, he wouldn't be in a job now. So I, I'm if it, if it was one thing, someone said, just one thing, I'd say get experience um, in an area that you're interested in. There's organisations as well that can have work experience schemes. So where it, where it's, you know, like workplaces don't feel like they're exploiting people. Offering work experience as a company is a good idea. And there's funded internship programmes as well. Like I said, there is a balance between, there is a balance between someone volunteering and, and almost, I think, being taken advantage of. But I have seen within structured programmes, it's the best thing. I helped someone get a job as a bike mechanic now 12 years ago, and he started off on work experience. Amazing. He wouldn't have a job. He bought his first house last year as well. He wouldn't have a job to this day if that company hadn't done work experience. And I'm, I'm very pragmatic, and actually he, wouldn't, he would have struggled to do application forms. He would have struggled to do an interview. He's just so good at fixing bikes. Like, mm. though we did a work trial, work, it started as work experience, and it became a work trial around fixing bikes. I'd think he was there. He went in two days a week for six weeks on his work experience slash work trial. He's been there, you know, that was 2008. That's 13 years later. So I know some people say, oh, they, people shouldn't do work experience or volunteering because, it, 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 you know, you're not getting paid. But then at the same time, I'm pragmatic and he wouldn't have got through the traditional channel. So that's that's the number one thing, as you can see. I'm very passionate about that. Yeah. Um, I think as someone myself, I struggle filling in forms, getting something. This sounds so basic, doesn't it? But getting people to check your stuff, like your, your application forms and things, because although I would want a world that we live in where it doesn't matter so much about your spelling and things like that and people focus on your skills and experience, people might often, if they've got 100 CVs and the spelling mistakes on some, Maybe every recruiter's done it. They're like, right, they don't get through. So getting someone to check all of that stuff for you. Um, I've, yeah, I struggle with written communication. I always get someone to, to check my work. Like I said, I don't have a diagnosis or anything, but I've never done an application form without it being checked. So getting volunteer experience, work experience. And actually, I think a lot of us did when we were younger. I don't know if you don't mind me asking, did you do any volunteering or work experience when you were younger? So I did. So I think it was in year 10 or year 11, yeah. you had to do the two weeks yeah, yeah. of work experience. Um, so I did that. I did it at Marks and Spencer's. Um, and when I finished my GCSEs, my dad had a friend who owned a, uh, a garage. Uh, yeah. And he sent me there to do some work experience for a few weeks as well. And I loved it. It was, it was so enjoyable. But I loved what you just said there because, and we didn't set this up. This is just how, it, how it's gone. But yeah. So many autistic people don't have those connections that we just talked about. So one of my first jobs came up because I went to a youth club and a man that ran the youth club also worked in the beef eater locally and he got me a job washing up there. But because I had those connections, like you're talking about through family and stuff as well, and at school, you get that experience. A lot of autistic people end up um, excluded from school because their needs aren't met. So they don't even get that experience we all got in year 10 or whatever it was. Um, and a lot of the time, autistic people and their families are ostracised, so they don't get even those those bits of experience you've got there talking about working in the garage and stuff. So that's why I, I can't emphasise enough where if I feel like we all do do that volunteering and work experience to an extent, but often a lot of autistic people are excluded from society, so they don't even get to have it when we might have all had it when we were younger. Yeah. <clears throat> and with um, so you, you mentioned you work pretty much with employers now do you yes. still do it on the kind of quote-unquote candidate side and, and help individuals get into work not really but once in a while I pick up a sort of case and just do it I don't even like the term pro bono but like I volunteer my time to help someone a couple of people sometimes contact me on LinkedIn and stuff and say can I help them um like especially if they're children around 14 15 and and I'll, and I'll always give advice and go and meet with people and 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 say what I've 
I think from my perspective, I've seen what works and I, and I know it's pragmatic and sometimes we need to overhaul the whole system uh, and there's there's lots we need, but that I would, yeah, I do sometimes still help, but mostly I want to help you, the employer, change what you do so that you'll recognise if someone yeah. comes to interview and struggles with certain questions, they might be autistic or if you've got someone who's struggled with written application, but they could be fantastic at, you know, you need creative people in, in your in your workplace. Like, are you missing out on them? Because you don't, because yeah. they don't get through assessment centres. Yeah, one hundred percent. And um, so you mentioned some organisations and some charities and not for profits that do do these sort of things. Yeah. Maybe if you send across some links, we can include it in the description box for people yeah. to reach out to them. <clears throat> That's a really good idea. Yeah. Places like the National Autistic Society have um, autism at work programs. Um, you can look into charities like. British Dyslexia Association, they'll have advice there for dyslexic people, Dyspraxia Foundation and the ADHD Foundation. Amazing. Well, we'll include all those links in the description box and people can check it out for themselves. Uh, so you mentioned you work kind of exclusively with businesses now. So what would you, what, what would be the things you'd, you'd advise businesses to do to make sure they are being inclusive to neurodivergent people? I think send signs and signals as a business and um, that you embrace neurodiversity. And that can start from senior leaders in your organisation coming forward and saying they've got ADHD, they've got dyslexia, they've got children with dyslexia. I mean, we've got to be private about people's children, but maybe them talking about family connections or them having it themselves. I've seen a lot of leaders recently, the children might be diagnosed with ADHD, then they realise they've always had it. So senior leaders, people in the workplace talking about it. When you have your neurodiversity staff network set up, maybe having profiles somewhere on the website that says someone says like, I'm person X, I'm autistic, I'm supported by MBF in this way. And then people looking to come and work with you guys would be like, all right, I can see these profiles that are there. Something I saw from one organization was they had a particular con person that you could contact if you had a neurodiverse condition or were disabled and um, to say what adjustments you need at an um, interview. Instead of, and it sounds so small again and so basic, but instead of it being like recruitment at MVF, it was Catherine at EY. Yeah. And then they had like 500 people contact her. And interestingly, 70% of them dyslexia. I think people oh. respond to a picture and a name rather than recruitment at. So yeah, there's, there's really small, they, I think sometimes when I work with employers, they like really surprised because I'll say these like five, six simple things and I think they think I'm going to, do them a big big audit and undertake all this all this stuff but it's, some, it's not, honestly it can be such small things to to be inclusive yeah and then what what kind of reasonable adjustments are needed for those with like like say let's say in the interview process for yeah. if they had dyslexia dyspraxia or adhd and um, it can be things like questions in advance that you know, people often think that's um, controversial, but if you remember, we talked about in the training how some people have like strengths in certain areas, but challenges in others. If you've got a difficulty in working memory and an employer says to you, tell me about a time you had conflict in the workplace. What did you learn from it? And what did you do? And what would you do differently next time? It's four questions. It's really hard to remember those even just now, as I said them. <laughs> so some questions in advance can help with that. And the idea of reasonable adjustments is to bring people up to the same level as everybody else. Yeah. You know how we have our buildings all need to be accessible now, like physically. Yeah. We never think, oh, that gives someone an advantage. We just think that, that, that you know, levels the playing field. And that's what I'm trying to really get employees to understand. And so often with questions in advance, people say, oh, they're going to prepare it too much or, or, or stuff like that. But actually, isn't it just a good way of giving someone the opportunity to present their best selves? The alternatives that are printing out the question on the day so that like if you're interviewing me now I could look like I have looked at some of the questions you know like when I've been when I've been um on like panels and stuff before yeah like, they, you know they might you might already know what questions are going to be asked if you're on panels and stuff so then just being able to look at them there and then can help so printing out questions or if we're doing a lot now virtually putting the questions in the chat box okay so um, as as the, as they're being asked or yeah. beforehand well well yeah so if you're if you're okay with questions in advance i'd do it in advance as gold practice but also think as they're being asked is fine okay. so you could just have them typed up before you do the interview and just cut and paste them in once you've once you've said it but i've seen that work really well um extra time sometimes for an interview 
with the processing stuff that some people have more reflective processing and um, going first on a day or last that can make a big difference going, what do you mean by going first or so if you've got dyslexia or adhd or, or autism dyspraxia you might have um higher levels of like anxiety sometimes it's associated with lower self-esteem lower confidence and higher anxiety because like i said at the start people are only identify what they can't do it's going to provide yeah. anxiety so if as a reason of adjustment someone's got higher anxiety they're f- they're the first interview of the day nine o'clock okay. the rest of the day is not spent worrying about it so and again it's tiny things isn't it like you, you might not even thought about it but it makes all the difference amazing and then when like it, now so we've gone past the interview stage once you're in a business like what are the sort of kind of day-to-day reasonable adjustments that could help people and so for people with dyslexia it could be even little things like two screens if you're involved with lots of like different numbers and information in your work or calendars getting dates out for your calendar and then putting it back in your email two screens can help with that working memory things for like dyspraxia another one that often people will challenge me on is I've suggested organizations provide, if you're dyspraxic, um, you can sometimes struggle with coordination, like um, sense of direction and stuff like that. But a lot of dyspraxic people would be great in like jobs like delivering training or getting new business, you know, working with clients. So if you're out on, off, if you're off site and you need to get out and about like London, um, it can be good or wherever you're based, it can be good to have taxi allowance. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, it wouldn't even be that much, but then that, your organization wants to sell something to another organization you want your person turning up looking at their best not stressed not having to spill coffee down them stuff like that and little things like that ta- taxi allowance would alleviate all of that you know i don't know if you've ever tried to exit bank at the right exit in 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 london oh, my like goodness <laughs> yeah so i think that's how it can be for dyspraxic people all the time everywhere yeah so little things like that autistic people it can be that the managers just use very clear, specific, precise instructions. Like you almost need to think sometimes from your non-autistic perspective that you're being pedantic. So saying things like, can you do that report um, by four o'clock today and email it back to me? Because I've had incidences where autistic people have nearly lost their job because they've done all this work. The manager says, well, I've never seen it. And you talk to the autistic person. They say, well, then no one ever told me I had to send it on to anyone else. And to you, that might, or people that are non-autistic, that might seem like, well, it's obvious, but it's not always obvious. So just being very clear, um, specific and precise for for autistic people. And I think for people with ADHD, some sort of acknowledgement or acceptance, they might not always be at their desk. So walking meetings can really help. Um, Just acceptance that someone isn't always at their desk from from their peers, their colleagues and manager can really help. So... That's, that's four across the four we talked about there. And obviously, you know, I could talk about many more all day, but. Yeah, I remember. The the right. training, yeah, I remember the training you were talking about kind of sensory stuff. Yeah. So was it not, not not being too bright or something like that? So yeah, it's different for everybody, but some people with the sensory processing difference, the fluorescent lights flash for them, but they don't flash for other people. It might be even sat next to a plug. Some autistic people said to me they can hear the electricity. So just moving them away from there. Um, yeah, so just, I think it's asking people sometimes, like, do you find something difficult in this environment? But sometimes you might need to be precise and say, is the lighting distracting you? Is there any noise distracting you? You might need to be quite specific about it. But I think when I started my career, sensory stuff wasn't even thought about. So that's something that hopefully workplace will start to think of a lot more as, as we move move back towards back towards offices. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware, but MVF have recently uh, changed offices as well. Okay. Our, our new offices in Old Street opened up in April, I think, uh, so a couple of months back. And the amount of planning that yeah. the, the space team did, and they really created an amazing environment where you've got like quiet spaces, you've got <clears throat> like, focus spaces, you've got collaboration spaces, and like there's different lightings. We even have like a Zen zone. So if people just need to kind of like chill out for a do some meditation or whatever it may be like we've tried to accommodate for every kind of scenario it's obviously hard to do it, do it for every kind of scenario but like it's it's a it's a massive ask and i know a lot of planning went into it i love that so when people say how can we make our building like autism friendly or neurodiverse friendly it's not one answer it's what you've just said it's having quiet spaces 
focus spaces, collaboration spaces. I, what I like to do in the workplace is in the morning, I feel quite buzzy. So I want to like, be around people. And then in the afternoon, I might want to go and be a bit quieter. And, and it's, that's so good. That's what neurodiversity for me is about, that we recognise, celebrate and accept that we all think differently. And then in the workplace, how can we sort of allocate for, for that or allow for that? And I think what you've said is perfect. So um, I'd love to come and see them when we're all back, when we're all back in and allowed and uh, you, you like reference you guys. Hey, you're you're always welcome at welcome at MVF. Everyone really loved the stuff you were doing with <laughs> us. So we'll we'll have you back anytime. Yeah, I love it. I've, I've I've been frustrated this year doing so much online because I spent my whole career trying to avoid a nine to five desk job. Um, but, <laughs> but um, <laughs> hopefully restrictions will be lifting soon and we can have a bit of a hybrid model. So sometimes training will be in person, sometimes it will be online and stuff like that. Hopefully. So, um, conscious of time. So I'll I'll probably end with this last question. Um, so what do you do if you think you, you, yourself or someone you work with or someone you know is neurodiverse in some way, shape or form? If it's yourself and you're willing to explore it, there's some good sort of like online screening tools out there. I would do a few. There's, I, I know it might sound a bit glib, but some of the ones that come up on Google first are good. Like I'd do a few like invest you know like you would with anything you, you might like if you're having someone come around to do some work in your house you might talk to three or four people i'd look at three or four different um types of screenings um investigate that you can go through the nhs for things like autism and adhd that can take a long long time dyslexia dyspraxia often um private companies can do diagnosis as well and they're not diagnosed through the nhs self-identification is acceptable so looking into it, looking into books by people with those those profiles, I found that really useful. Um, it's a bit trickier for people that you know. It depends on how well you know them. Mm, it can be a bit of an awkward conversation, I would, I'd imagine. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, so if you know someone really, really, really well. But it, another thing I've often said is to advise, you know, you could say, oh, I went on this neurodiversity training. It was fantastic. It talked about these strengths. Like, did you know that dyslexia, a lot of dyslexic people are great verbally and good at problem solving, like, um that's how I've talked to my friends about it you know I've known some of my friends like 20 years and such so it's a bit easier I don't know it, it I think it's really celebrating it as much as possible and, and talking about things like the neurodiversity staff network training um if it's a family member and, and you feel more comfortable talking about it with them then I would always lead with the positive and use specific examples um but it is it is a harder question and if someone you work with I'd be very careful. Again, it depends on how much well you know them, but I'd be really careful in the workplace. But the more profiles you have from people in the workplace, like if this neurodiversity staff network has some people that want to come forward and, and be, you know, on the website, on the internet or whatever, saying they've got dyslexia, ADHD, like we need to see all different representations of it. You know, with yeah. autism, we only see really one representation of autism in the media, which is of a white man or a white boy. We need to be seeing all different representations because other groups don't identify with it. Mm. Um, so, you know, I talked about my training a lot, how, how women don't get diagnosed effectively. And I think a lot of it, there's so many reasons why, but some of it as well is there's not a lot of autistic women in, in the media. Um, you've got Greta Thunberg now is autistic and ADHD. So hopefully with her talking about it a lot more, maybe some, some young women will, will look at her and think, oh, perhaps I'm autistic. For some people, it's a bit of a journey for themselves. So if you drop that bombshell, you know, to use a phrase, if you just talk to them out of the blue and said, I think you're dyslexic, they might not like it. So yeah. some people, it's like the seed, you need to plant the seed and it grows and it's a journey for them. Yeah. Because it goes back to a question about learning difficulty. Everyone associates this stuff with negatives. So... I don't know if I completely answered your question, but talk with the positives. We need more role models in the workplace and in the media, and we need more diverse role models as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I know I said that was the last question, but you just triggered something, something right. else in my mind. You mentioned that a lot of women in particular go undiagnosed. What's the reason behind that? So a lot of women go undiagnosed with um, autism and ADHD, actually, because of the, the sort of stereotype around autism. A lot of the initial early research on, on autism was done on, on boys and men. Um, a lot of women talk to me about how they mask their autism. So they, they, they don't act how they want to act. They're not their authentic selves. Um, so people don't pick up on it. Um, they might mimic other people. 
just to like, because obviously I talk about this a lot further and a lot broader on training, but one thing I think I've noticed is if a profile or a condition doesn't impact on others, it doesn't really get diagnosed as much. So with a lot of the men I spoke to, when they were boys, they tell at school, they found school so hard that, you know, the, the teacher would find them hard and they'd get suspended or expelled and it would lead to diagnosis. It, that's impacting on other people. But a lot of the women I spoke to when they were younger, it doesn't impact on others. So it doesn't really get diagnosed until women are at absolute crisis. Then it gets diagnosed. A lot of young girls don't get diagnosed because when they're at school, they're, you know, quote, a model pupil. But then when they're at home, then they're exhibiting some of those characteristics associated with autism. The parents are saying, look, I think my girl's autistic, but the professionals don't see it. Oh, wow. Same with ADHD. A lot of women might have a more sort of inattentive type of ADHD, which isn't the more physical type. And actually, I think a lot of men don't get diagnosed with this effectively as well, but the diagnostic rates are higher for, for men, again, with ADHD. I think a lot of women's ADHD doesn't impact on others, so obviously. And I think in society, we diagnose people when it impacts on others a lot more. But yeah, I, I could yeah. I think I could do a PhD on that subject, the underrepresented <laughs> groups of, uh, when it comes to diagnostic stats. And, and this is why we need to accept self-identification. Yeah. No, it's so interesting. And I can probably sit down and talk to you all day. Yeah. And I really, really appreciate the time you spent uh, this morning discussing this. And I'm sure I'll probably email you with tons of other questions. And maybe when, when we're setting up our neurodiverse network at MVF, we'll be hitting you up for some advice and, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, just wanted to thank you so much for your time. Really, really uh, appreciate it. Um, and uh, I'll be sure to speak to you soon. No, I, I loved it. And then um, this was just the perfect way to do it. And um, like verbally, if I'd have had to write all this down, I probably would never have done it and disappointed <laughs> you. So it's good that we could do this. So thank you very much for having me.